All right, okay, this is the first of three lectures <clears throat> about propaganda. Propaganda, in case I, I need to lean into the mic a little bit more. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, Lord. How will I establish this framing shot? Christ. Um, okay, so uh, you can see the outline of the uh, lecture here. I'll let you pause it, and then I'm going to move myself over it so I'm not staring over into the side. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, these three lectures are an introduction to Again, a very complex topic about which whole courses are given. And um, <clears throat> nevertheless, my feeling is that it's better to have a little bit um, than, than nothing or very relatively little. This, that's sort of not very well organized necessarily. We, you probably all have been exposed to a, I'm expecting multiple discussions on propaganda, and uh, so you're going to come with a whole bunch of things, and that's fine. That's great, terrific. You know, whatever you've got, bring it in, direct, you know, bring it along. That's great, terrific. So this is just a way to, to an, another way to think about it, and to, as always, I'm I'm all about trying to provide a usable framework that you can take away and say, well, okay, that didn't work for me, Tim, but this works. Fine. Okay. We get our contemporary usage of the word propaganda from the Roman Catholic Church, um, specifically Pope Gregory the Fifteenth, who in 1622 was dealing with the threat posed mostly by Protestantism or Protestants in the Protestant Reformation in Europe. <clears throat> and you know, do you remember what the Protestant Reformation is? There's going to be a short quiz. <laughs> But basically, to put it into one sentence, the Protestants, the Catholics, specifically the Catholics from Rome, um, had been running things, had been running Christianity up until now. The, the, the versions of Christianity that there were, were largely versions that were what are called Montanist. Uh, they were, from our perspective, <clears throat> they were, they came from the Papal States and they were issued by, in the, in the version of Christianity that everybody got, came from Rome. Okay, from the Holy See in Rome and the Pope, um, who was supposed to be duly elected by God and all this stuff. It was just really, it was, it was a very early corporation, the Catholic Church, and uh, it was extremely powerful. And um, in the late 16th century and in the early 17th century, so by 1622, um, the Protestants under Martin Luther, amongst others, began to protest, literally, the way that Christianity was being run by the Roman Catholics, that is Catholics from Rome. Because people say, well, are there, is there any other kind of Catholics? Like, sure, yeah. Uh, Catholics who are not from Rome. So um, these Protestants were against a number of different things in the Catholic Church, which I'm not gonna go into, but basically what they were mostly interested in and what the real split was was the Protestants wanted to take the power of the church and put it into the hands of people. For want of a better summary. <laughs> and what that meant specifically was that the Protestant priests uh, argued, because there were still priests, that people should um, have a direct relationship with God by, and this would happen by reading the Bible. And so they would ju be justified in their faith by, they, were, they, were, they would be justified in God by their faith alone. It was justification by faith alone. And they did not need to be told by the Catholic Church that they were true believers. 
basically. They needed to be able to read the Bible for themselves and interpret it. And so what you, this is, um, you can see, I mean, this is the beginning of the end as far as the Catholics are concerned. And they were quite right. Um, there was going to be, it wasn't the end, um, but the Catholic Church, which had been the only game in town up to this point, the only game in the world in, of Christianity, now became thoroughly challenged, and there were going to be centuries, really, of religious wars, which in many ways are still sort of going on. They're not, uh, yeah. But for our purposes, that was the thing that made Gregory the Fifteenth flip out, and in 1622, he uh, established an office to counter the Protestant world of information and persuasion that they were right, because this is going to look a lot cheaper. The thing about Protestantism was that a, a great deal of the Catholic Church was built on money and on getting money for all kinds of things, uh, for all kinds of, including sort of day-to-day -day observances of the faith, which everything cost money, it, to cost money to worship, basically. And the more money you had, the more blessed you were supposed to be. Um, and so on. So Gregory starts this church, this uh, office. And the office is called this. Uh, it is called the Sacra Congregatio de Propaganda de Fides, um, which is can be roughly translated as the sacred congregation or group about the propagation of the faith. Uh, where propaganda here is a descriptive word. It is not, it does not have the ill meanings that we have for it now. For instance, if when people often now say, well, that's just advertising. Most people see advertising as a sort of necessary evil. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's irritating and it takes your time and it, you know, it, 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 it takes up space on the screen or whatever it might be. It, it prevents you from seeing the thing you want to see. You have to wait it out and so on. But basically, we look at advertising and say, most people look at advertising and go, oh, well, how's advertising? You know, what do you expect? Well, this is kind of how uh, propaganda originally was intended. It was like, this is just means the propagation, which means just created and it's like, sort of like saying the distribution. It's like, well, distribution isn't a political word. Well, it can be, but everything is political, right? So uh, what's important here is propaganda fides. These are the two important words. I mean, these are, which is, this propagation of the faith. It's like, well, how are you going to propagate the faith? So what it becomes is an information office. Now, to jump ahead uh, just a little bit <laughs> to World War II. <laughs> so we're going from 1622 <laughs> to 1941 in America, 1939 in Britain, Canada, and the UK, generally, and in Poland and so on the beginning of World War II. Propaganda was spoken openly as a tactic for persuasion, basically, in uh, democracies. I mean, it was, sort of, it was kind of understood as like it was a method, but it didn't really come to have this sort of bad odor to it, this really, really terrible odor to it until World War II and the Nazis got a hold of it. Specifically, until Goebbels, uh, the Reich Minister for for Propaganda, uh, for Information, the Information Ministry, basically got a hold of it, and this is what made it into the the bad word what we know today. To define propaganda is not unlike trying to define other inordinately difficult, vague concepts like freedom or justice, which I talked about um, in the last lecture. So we'll get it at this way. One of the problems I do lay down um, when, I, when I lay down this definition of propaganda, which I will in a moment, is that somebody's going to say, but that could be advertising. 
And for the purposes of the way I use propaganda, advertising is not propaganda. And I understand if you've read, I've got to have tea. I mean, it's just, come on, <laughs> this is, I'm not trying to persuade you. I'm just, I'm just saying it's a point of information. You're going to have to, you're going to have to wait while I get some tea here. <laughs> if I'm talking about 1622 of the propagation of the faith, uh, you have to have tea for that. Either that or you have to have a really good, strong claret, I guess, or sherry, yeah. And Amontillado. Um, so I know that you have maybe read Noam Chomsky. You probably read maybe uh, parts of uh, Manufacturing Consent. Maybe you read all of Manufacturing Consent and you may have, uh, that's great, terrific. And so I know that advertising is going to be included by Chomsky as uh, effectively where's the difference between advertising and propaganda. I mean, he is and isn't going to sort of say that. He's going to, he's going to struggle with it because all, we all struggle with it. And what I'm saying to you is that there are no clear particular lines. I mean, it's a, gray, it's a huge gray area. But there are some things we can say, this is advertising and this is not. This is propaganda, and this is not advertising. You know, this is advertising, not advertising. Advertising, 